Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you are listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds to find out more about membership and how you can join the community and carry on the conversation visit www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click the membership button in the main menu But we will get going with today's episode, where I'm going to start by letting you know that we unfortunately had some slight audio issues when recording this episode. The issues were on my end, which means when I'm talking, it might sound slightly crackly throughout the episode and slash or skip at times, which I apologize for in advance. Luckily, our guest's audio was completely fine. And on that note, the amazing guest we have on today's show is one Carrie Kish. Carrie is an avid herpetologist and animal trainer with a 15-year career in professional dog training, working primarily with dangerous dogs and dogs with fear and anxiety disorders. In 2012, while working for San Diego Zoo Global, Carrie co-founded Reptelligence with her co-worker and good friend Alex Knold, with the intention of exploring and showcasing the cognition abilities of reptiles and amphibians. Since that time, the Facebook page Reptelligence, Enrichment, Training and Education has gained an international following, including pet owners, veterinarians, zoo curators, professional animal keepers and trainers of all species. Carrie has worked closely with a variety of species from rhinos to roaches, parrots to porcupines, cheetahs to kestrels and tuataras to tarantulas. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Biola University and is working towards a Master's degree in Ethology at the Ethology Institute, University of Cambridge. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Carrie Kish to the show today. Carrie, how are you? I am great. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Thank you for having me. It's quite, I feel quite privileged to be speaking to you. Um, I love your uh, project that you've started and all the wonderful discussion that has been facilitated through it. Thank you very much, Carrie. And it's an honor to have you. Thank you for taking time out of your day. And I've been wanting, this is, this will be episode, what are we, 51, 52, I think 53 if I'm correct. Uh, and I've been wanting to do a reptile episode for 53 episodes. <laughs> so. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I'm so, I'm so happy that you have an interest in, in this. Yeah. Well, as I said, I, I, I'm on full conviction. We found the right person for the job. So very excited about the conversation that's about to follow. I'm so excited. Um, and I am a behavior nerd and, uh, so it's exciting to spend time talking to another behavior nerd. If, I, if it's okay, if I call you that. <laughs> about reptiles and uh, all the amazing things happening with their training and enrichment. I, I'm self-identified behavior nerd, so that's completely fine. <laughs> We're going to dive straight into the first question, Carrie. Can you please build on your introduction that we just gave there and share more about what you currently do, reptelligence, and your view of the importance of training and enriching reptiles and, and also educating others about it? Yeah, certainly. Um, Reptelligence actually started, um, I guess this is now five or six years in ago, uh, and it was just me and my friend, and we were sitting around saying, um, gosh, it, there's, there's, there's no resource for zookeepers. There are these different studies going on within the science community. There's some um, citizen science 
but wouldn't it be great if we could bring it all together in one place? And so we sat there and we made this Facebook page and we watched the numbers go up, you know, uh, 10 people, oh, yay, 20 people, yay, there's 20 people that care about reptile training. This is amazing. And now it's sort of grown to something larger than uh, I think either of us could have imagined. Uh, but at Reptelligence, uh, we have a small number of reptiles from different taxa that we are working on um, training and enrichment with. So uh, finding ways to uh, give choice and control to these animals and then uh, making that information readily available to other both hobbyists, uh, veterinarians, zookeepers, and encouraging also a conversation among other keepers and hobbyists so that um, it's just a free sharing of information to sort of push forward uh, this, I guess it's a bit um, controversial of the status quo that, you know, um, reptiles maybe need more than, than what they're getting and how can we uh, advance that. And then, so in addition to um, the work, the work done with the physical animals at Reptelligence, we also do a lot of education and discussion and are available for questions for those that are training animals or even have questions just about uh, basic husbandry to get to the point of being able to provide more en enrichment and training. Yeah, well, we're definitely grateful for the inspiration that you and Alex originally had to get this started. So on behalf of Planet Earth, thank you. Uh, and we will link to the Reptelligence Facebook page. Is that the best area to link to from the podcast write-up? It is right now, and it does actually have a, a website link uh, that will forward to the page. Uh, but currently, there is not a formal website set up uh, for the for the Reptelligence project, uh, but that may be coming in the future. And I will give you that link as well. Everyone's on Facebook, uh, and so that's, that's a pretty smart place to be hanging out, I think. Uh, I like that you use some words in there, choice and control. That's something we talk about a lot on this podcast. And the other word that you chose to use in there was controversial. So how does what we're doing now via Reptelligence and, and the great stuff you're doing, how does that compare to, let, am, am I okay to label it traditional way of management? I mean, I think that we, uh, I think uh, those of us that are very involved in behavior and and where behavior um, modification and training and studying and research is going in the future, uh, try to stay away from labels in general. But I think as far as maybe how most people would view it, I think traditional is a fine word. Um, so there are uh, certain there are certain, I think, I would say, uh, not to steal Susan Friedman's word, but I think cultural fog is, is a great word <laughs> to describe. Uh, maybe sometimes we see things in reptiles, even as um, traditional keepers who manage reptiles, and we uh, interpret it differently because we've sort of been told to interpret it differently. So maybe we see a reptile make a choice or invite a social contact or um, interact with an enrichment device in a way that we didn't expect. And we almost want to discount it because ah, it's a reptile and it can't do that. And I think that that puts us as a, at a disadvantage as reptile keepers uh, because I think maybe we're missing uh, some of what uh, the, the most thing, amazing things about reptiles are. And I think some of the traditional management has moved towards keeping these animals in smaller and smaller spaces with less and less, uh, I guess, as a keeper, I would call it furniture, plants and different uh, spaces within their, their habitat. And so I think the more we minimize, and I would almost call it deprivation, uh, the more that we create a deprived environment for reptiles, the less behavior we see, which in turn sort of reinforces this idea that uh, the status quo that reptiles don't have behavior, that they are merely reactive, that they uh, don't have premeditated thinking, that they don't make choices and and whatnot. And so obviously um, coming in and saying, uh, yes, they do show preferences. Yes, they can be trained. Yes, uh, they can make choices. Yes, that choice and control is important. Yes, the ability to um, display a full array of their natural behavior in human care is important. Uh, I think it does kind of butt heads a bit with traditional management. 
So it's really, from what I'm taking away from what you're saying, us changing how we see things. And, and it reminds me of something I heard about a 100-meter sprint and a record for that and at a time in history, people were saying, oh, you can't do the 100-meter sprint in X amount of minutes and then someone did it and then suddenly everyone was doing it. Is is that a good analogy for what's happening yeah. in reptile training? People are saying, well, it's not important. Yeah, and, you know, a, a, a follower of the page told me actually just recently and I thought it was an interesting analogy. She's been um, an animal trainer for almost four decades and she said, I remember when dolphins were just dumb fish. And she's sort of um, aligning that to where reptile training and enrichment is going and that, you know, our perceptions so much sort of alter what we're seeing. And once that um, those perceptions are sort of changed, we see things in a different way. So I think I think that analogy you've used as well is quite perfect. And um Sort of by default, I think reptilians have come become a place where uh, invert keepers are coming as well and saying, ah, where can I talk about spiders or uh, where can I talk about mantids? And um, we've just sort of enveloped all of that, <laughs> even though I still have quite a bit of um, learning to do myself on invertebrates. So you talk about how reptilians has got many different goals. One of them is to, to share this information with the wider community. You're also quite passionate, and correct me if I'm wrong, about sharing this information with people who visit zoos and wildlife parks and showing them that reptiles can and do learn and engage in their environment more. Can you speak to the importance of this? Absolutely. Um, and one of the, the big motivations in, in starting with intelligence actually started with how zoo visitors see reptiles in zoos. And within zoos, there is a bit of a political structure that you have to get through to change husbandry, to change enrichment. And by having a resource where um, keepers can go and say, hey, look, this organization is doing this. Can we try it too? I feel like that makes that change a little bit easier because you're not simply saying, let me try this. I don't know if anyone ever has before. But the main motivation is um, I actually started with habitat design and I was doing a lot of re restructuring habitats such that the animals would utilize the entire habitat. And when they were moving around or when they were interacting with enrichment, uh, I saw that zoo visitors were much more likely to stand there and to watch the animal for longer and to interact uh, with the keepers and ask questions and be so much more interested in what the animals were doing. And so I really wanted to take this outside the habitat. So being in uh, education for most of my zoo career, I've worked largely with animal ambassadors, animals that come out up close to people. And um, one of the things that uh, that really sort of sparked it and took it off is when I started with the reptile show with the wonderful Kate Silvera at the Libby Desert. Um, and they were doing so many wonderful things to showcase uh, reptile behavior. And the, the, the show just continued to grow and grow and grow until there was, you know, standing room only for a reptile show, which is quite exciting uh, because these animals were not simply being held in hand and talked about. They were doing behaviors and that behavior was being discussed. And um, from that, uh, we realized, well, the snakes need some training as well. And so it would be, you know, the lizard comes out and he's targeting and doing uh, these wonderful stand up behaviors. And then the tortoise comes out and he's showing showcasing choice and control moving across the stage. And then we had, you know, the snake in our hands and we're talking about the snake and um, you could noticeably see a difference in the audience. And so when we took that snake and put it on a branch so it could move freely back and forth across the branch and then finally built a structure that the snake could move around the, like a tree like structure um, so that people could see the snake moving there was there's a change in how the audience looked at that animal and there was a change in how they interacted with that animal after the show so when we're doing touching after when you have the snake simply in your hands and notice that people were more likely to be more rough 
with the animal. But if they're on the, the tree and you're telling them, this animal has a choice of whether he wants to stay and interact. If he goes up high, then we're done touching. And if he goes into his crate, he's saying that he's well done. And how we're interacting with him, if we're gentle, if we are kind with him, if you know we're touching one at a time and we're, we're gentle, he'd be more likely to stay here for a longer amount of time. And I saw that that really resonated with visitors and they started to see the animal not as an object, but as a living being, that their behavior had a consequence on how the animal behaved. And it, it was just a beautiful thing to see. And it's just further motivated me to continue um, with this project and be able to show that with all of these different taxa of reptiles. I look forward to, to listening back to this conversation in 10 years' time and seeing seeing where everyone's at because what you've described is absolutely fantastic and excites me. And also, I've seen a picture of that structure somewhere. Is it, is it on the Reptelligence page for people to go look at? Uh, I don't know if it is on the Reptelligence page. It's certainly on different zookeeper pages. I've had different keepers visit the show. Uh, and they, they tend to post some pictures of it. Um, and uh, I could I could certainly send you some pictures and we could see about getting some up on the page as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's out there <laughs> for sure. Yeah, we could maybe get one or two and put in the, the write-up even for people to, to go see what this tree looks like. Certainly, that would, certainly. That'd be really cool. Hey, thank you so much for sharing, Carrie. Moving forward, we've talked about all of these ideas and we always like to back up ideas with science. And there, ha there has been significant research done here, hasn't there? Can you talk about some of the research that you're aware of that's been done with learning and training in snakes and other ectotherms? Yeah, there is actually considerable. Well, it, I, I would say it's a bit hard to find. So if you, which we noticed also when we were first starting Reptelligence, um, you sort of have to be uh, committed to looking for it. But there are some actual published studies out there. Um, I think... A couple of the ones that I enjoyed the most are um, there is a well, well, there's pros and cons to these studies, of course, because they're in sort of a science environment, right? So we're keeping the animals a bit of a sterile, deprived environment in order to get these results, which I have a bit of an ethical conflict with. But there is an indigo study, which is with the eastern indigo snake, which is one of my favorite snakes. And they were trained through negative reinforcement. So they were shaped with water. Um, they were given water as a reward for doing this behavior. And they were shaped from touching a, a string to touching a button. And touching the button, they were then able to obtain water. So this was a multiple sessions. So it shows that they had memory as they went through these sessions. Uh, it showed that operant conditioning was possible. Uh, it showed that water could be used as a reinforcer. And... Uh, well, another thing it showed, which I guess we can take it for however we like, but that snakes were willing to perform this behavior even if it did not yield a reinforcer every single time. So um, I think one of the things that needs more data and study is, you know, can how long can snakes keep these memories? Do they stay with them or do they have more of a short-term memory? And I think this study shows that, that they can sort of keep this memory a longer time. Um, there is a, a corn snake study that, uh, which is quite old. It's probably one of the beginning studies where we were actually studying snakes in an ecologically significant way versus kind of trying to subject them to the same studies that we would do with mammals, where they put corn snakes in a very large open space, which most snakes, uh, especially if they have not been trained to be comfortable with that or are habituated, will then immediately seek shelter. So they put them in this big open space and then shined a bright light on them. Um, so they would then seek shelter and they, they changed which holes led to shelter and which were simply sort of blank holes. And they put signals, uh, visual signals above the ones that actually led to shelter. And they showed that the snakes could actually learn which ones were the exits faster and faster. They went from seven, 700 seconds to just 30 seconds. Uh, so that's quite a bit more than we could say is simply an, a statistical anomaly. It seems to show that there was actually training involved there. And um, another one that I enjoy is there was some scent training with, with garter snakes and they trained them to make choices as far as which way that they would go in a, a device if they were going to go to one side or the other. And then once they had trained them uh, to 
go to the scent. So they started with, I think, a lemon scent. Uh, they then trained them to avoid the lemon scent and go to the other side, and they saw similar data with each. So they were not simply displaying a preference for the smell. Uh, they were just displaying actual training in that regard, and um, that seems to indicate an uh, ability for operant conditioning as well. Uh, and then I think the most recent is probably the, with the wild Burmese python, where they were trained to press a button to obtain food. Um, again, there was a little bit of deprivation in this in that they were offered very small food rewards, uh, but they were able to be trained through operant conditioning to do so. So, I mean, there's, there's, that's not an insignificant amount of published studies, and I, I would dare to say that there's probably more out there. Uh, but again, it's it's not the easiest to find. You, if you just type in, you know, snake uh, cognition, you know, it takes a bit of time to sort of sort through everything and find find uh, what's out there. And so, just with the, we'll go back to the start of the indigo snakes. Uh, you mentioned that it was trained via negative reinforcement. So, what you're talking about there is the snakes were deprived of water, so they were drinking to remove first. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, and- yes. That's what they were doing. Um, I have. Uh, I heard from a couple of hobbyists that they are using water, um, droplets of water as a, a positive reinforcer, for, for the, sorry, <laughs> a positive reinforcer to uh, sort of build the trust bank with their snakes. So I don't want to discount water as a reinforcer, but in that case, there was some deprivation to improve the um, motivation to seek the water. And uh, just some natural history, uh, indigo snakes do tend to prefer a high humidity and they do drink water daily. So I think probably they were chosen in somewhat capacity for this study uh, for that reason. Cool. And the corn snakes chose color discrimination or demonstrated color discrimination. So the next step is match the sample training of corn snakes. Yeah. Uh, I think corn snakes are... Um, quite a good candidate for um, studying because they are active during the day and they uh, they are faster metabolism snake so they process food quickly um, and I mean uh, obviously we have a lot to learn about their cognitive abilities as well and, and how far those go. And then the garter snakes so they were reinforced for going to the trained sense uh, sorry smell or in a direction of that and, and then reinforced with food was it or how did that work yeah they were reinforced with food um the what's interesting is in that particular study they were really trying to separate uh the olfactory system so they were trying to particularly not allow the snake to touch the item that they were smelling with their tongue uh so they wanted to sort of see how far uh, they could go with just uh, a smell and a smell that was not a food-related item. So in the first set of studies, they used lemon, and in the second set of studies, they used a, a chemical that smells a bit like banana and apples. So definitely not items that these carn- carnivorous snakes or insectivorous snakes uh, or even fish eating snakes would go after. Uh, so it was a novel scent and they would situate it such that they would have to rely on um, their, a different part of their olfactory system. Yeah, super interesting. And I always have this thought, I think about these types of studies and, and what we take away from them. And the thought is that it's really cool, really amazing. And at the same time, it's kind of like if they didn't have this ability to learn, they would have gone extinct a long time ago. So it's also kind of, proving common sense to some degree in my potentially rational or irrational mind of Ryan Cartlidge. <laughs> yeah, of course there is that. I mean, everything on earth is, is made to behave. And so if an animal doesn't have behavior, uh, of course it's not going to survive. So, um, but again, coming up against what, what the status quo is now and what sort of these, static preconceptions are and how how highly we hold to them um it's i mean you sort of have to have this research to be able to show to kind of get through all of that that fogginess but i think we're getting there yeah and the work you're doing is definitely helps helping to lift that fog there was a lot of fun to learn about carrie for our next question firstly i want to congratulate you on your recent trip to Sweden to present at the Choice Control and Communication Conference. That's really exciting because you went over there to present on snake training, didn't you? 
I did, and I have to thank the wonderful Eva Bartleton for that opportunity. Um, it was quite amazing, and the amount of feedback and encouragement I have received from presenting there, I just it's just unfathomable, and I can't even probably express it well in words, but um, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience to um, meet up with so many other people that are excited about this this training and not even uh, I, I didn't even present it in the sense of training all ectotherms, although these principles certainly apply to all, but training snakes in particular to see people so excited about learning how to train snakes was just, I can't even express how amazing that was. Yeah, I can imagine. And we have uh, Ava to thank for this podcast as well. She put me in you in contact and I've had the pleasure of, looking over the presentation that you gave because you sent it through to me. So thank you very much for that. And I feel like we could do uh, numerous episodes, numerous podcast episodes just on that presentation. But I picked something out which I thought would resonate with the listeners of this podcast uh, and, and I thought it would be a good discussion point. And in that presentation, you gave four steps to training a snake. Can you run us through these four steps? I can. Um and then they're a bit loopy in the sense that one kind of leads to the other. And also I, I would say, I would preface it with, I don't think this just applies to snakes. Um, but the first step would be uh, taking data on the animal itself. So um, I think sometimes we get sort of super excited and I'm going to start this training program, but really the first important thing to do is observe the animal. How do they use their space? How do they react to you coming into or being around their space? Are they using their whole space? Or can we make some adjustments to make sure that, first of all, we're getting behavior within the habitat where they're comfortable before we're inviting them out? Um, is the animal healthy? Do they you know, eat, shed, and eliminate on a normal schedule? Is there anything we need to address in that regard? Um, and is the space appropriate for the species? I think sometimes I get approached about aggressive behavior in um, reptiles or different ectotherms. And sometimes it, it's, a, it's a husbandry issue where the animal doesn't feel comfortable. Um, and then, of course, if they're housed with other animals, you have to sort of take that into account. And how are you going to sort of separate them out for the training? Um, and then within that data as well, you're going to see kind of what how that animal displays their stress. And so uh, with one animal in particular, a uh, Dumeril's boa, when I first started working with her, we would give her boxes for enrichment. And we thought that it was quite lovely how she loved these boxes and she would sort of squeeze herself tightly into them. She would move in and out of them. But we realized um, when we gave her sort of a couple weeks off of being handled or being used for education, we would give her all these different boxes and she could care less about the boxes. So it wasn't that the box was reinforcing. It was that it was a way that she was showing that she was actually not comfortable. It was it was her way of seeking comfort. And so from being able to take that data, we were able to see, well, when she's squeezing tightly into her hide and there's not a good reason for it, she's not, it's not seasonal, she's not in a shed cycle. Well, that means that maybe she needs a day off or maybe she needs a couple of days off. And we could we're able to more carefully observe her behavior because of taking that step. Um, so that's just one example. And then the next step would be antecedent arrangement. And I think we all do this with training all species, but with reptiles and, and ectotherms, it's particularly important because we need to be um, conscious of their eco ecological needs. So if uh, we, we sort of have to balance what we're asking them to leave with what we're asking them to come to, because it, it, they don't just, it's not just food and water and, and tactile that are reinforcers. We have such a larger bank of reinforcers with them um, from humidity to misting to all different types of water presentation to heat and shade and shelter. And so sort of looking at that space in a very real way and seeing um, how, how are we going to allow this animal to say yes? How are we going to allow them to say no? Um, where, if they're where in their habitat, are we going to realize that maybe they're not interested in training today? Um, how are we going to decide how often we're going to train? Uh, I work with some animals that 
I train maybe once a week or once every 10 days. And that's not even because I'm using food reinforcers. It's because that's where that animal is at. And I start to see stress signals if we are, we are interacting with them more than that. So we're dealing with animals that are very uh, good conservationists in that they are used to sort of preserving their energy. And um, if you're, you're training too frequently, you can actually cause them extra stress. And so giving them how are we going to arrange the space to make sure that they truly have a choice. Um, And one of the big things to look at that, especially with young animals or animals that have not done a lot of training, is is there adequate flight distance in the habitat? Because a lot of these animals are prey animals, uh, even a lot of these snakes. Um, it, it, can that animal get far enough away from you to where they feel comfortable? And if not, how are you going to address that? Um, maybe it's by opening the door and taking a step back and allowing them to come to you. Uh, but you have to sort of find ways to work with the space that you have or to change the space. And I know as zookeepers, we don't always have the option right away of changing the space. And so kind of looking at creatively, how, I'm going, how am I going to work for this? How am I going to get this animal to a a place where they feel uh, safe and comfortable um, so that I can actually start training. Um, And then the next step would just be filling that trust bank like we would do with any any species, I think. Um, So offering different reinforcers to find preferred ones, um, create simple if-then contingencies. So if I do this, then this happens so that there starts to be some consistency to how you're interacting with them so they can predict what's going to happen next. Um, Start to offer enrichment opportunities. So again, uh, going back to the first step when you're taking data and you're seeing how they're using that entire space, thinking about how you can introduce enrichment items to help them to use the space more completely, to help them uh, go through their entire um, natural behavior repertoire. Uh, offering access can be a wonderful way to build trust and to build confidence in the animal. Um, I personally use a lot of puzzle feeders. Um, I find that it, it helps the snakes to spend more time in the feeding process and get out more natural behavior. Um, and then start allowing the snake to say no. So by altering your behavior in response to theirs. So I think a lot of times, especially with reptiles, we don't train them as frequently. So when we decide, oh, it's time to train the snake, we go to the habitat. And they may say they have no interest in training that day. But sometimes we want to push it because, well, I only have so much time and this is the time I've allotted. And with um, ectotherms, uh, because they move through their heat gradients differently, they digest differently, um, the motivations are just different. And sort of learning how to interpret that body language and make sure that we're listening uh, to, again, make sure that that trust bank is getting more and more full. And then as you sort of build that foundation, you can then raise the criteria, which would be step four, and making a plan for for learning make, that's going to be airless, making choices very easy, um, utilizing highest reinforcers for new behaviors and those requiring the most trust. Sometimes these, these uh, reinforcers are not food. Mo- oftentimes they're not food, especially with snakes, but with different ectotherms, you have different things available. Um, but oftentimes um, it's looking at, too, is this an animal that's more active in the PM or the AM? And can I interact with them when they're already active, when they're already offering behavior and sort of catch that behavior? And then throughout that kind of stopping and reassessing, am I progressing? Uh, Is the snake displaying any, or other ectotherm, displaying any signs of stress? And if not, what can I change to make them more comfortable and more likely to want to offer behavior? Listening to them throughout. Um, And then I guess, as I said before, just um, making sure that you're not overtraining because uh, they, they, they do operate a bit differently than mammals and birds. So I guess that was a quick one through. I thought hopefully I didn't talk too fast. <laughs> no, it was great. And to recap, and I might have got the label for the last one, incorrect the last of the four steps. But number one is collect your data. Number two is antecedent arrangement. Number three is filling that trust bank. Number four was, no, uh, sorry if I get this one wrong, was it make a plan? Uh, you could say that. I, I say raising criteria because you're – uh, I sort of look at it that the whole time that you're interacting with um, with your animal, whether you're feeding or cleaning, you're training them, whether you're looking at it as training or not. It's sort of 
I guess you could say passive training. And so um, when we get to step four, it's it's sort of raising your criteria and the animal's criteria and I guess making it into a more formal plan of how you're going to accomplish what you're looking to accomplish. But yeah, you could say make a plan as well. And so in that first step, collecting data, you talked about understanding snake body language and understanding signs of stress. Where can people go to learn more about learning about snake body language and for ectoferm body language? Ah, well, um, I have mostly learned through working with the snakes themselves. So um, I don't know that there's a proper link right now, but I can certainly put up some of that information on the Reptelligence site or uh, send you some to link to this uh, page as well. Um, But it's going to change also depending on your animal. So some snakes, like I mentioned with Jula, that Jumerals, she was very subtle with her changes in behavior. And you could have possibly even interpreted, you know, her utilizing those boxes as a positive thing. But through sort of watching her, you learn that to interpret it in a different way. Does that make sense? Yeah, through, through observation, which is yes. which is the first step, right? Uh, yeah. So there are many different signs of stress. Um, from uh, the, the the most common is probably the tensing or tightening of the body for the snake. Uh, but hyperactivity can also be so. Sometimes when we inter- introduce enrichment or training, we find a snake is very very active. Well, activity can be good, but it can also be a sign of stress. So. Um, Perhaps what would be best is, yeah, I'll, I'll put together some of these um, signs and link them to the page. Does that work? Or do you want to spend more time more time on this? That would be amazing. No. No, I think that works and people can people go people that are interested in that specific side of things, which should hopefully be everyone that's working with these species, can go to the page and get that further information. With regards to antecedent arrangement, you said setting up yes no option so the snake can say yes or no right now this is cluttered in the fog i'm going to take a guess for a a significant amount of people who work with reptiles uh, and hopefully my way of describing things (laughs) resonates with people what advice can we give to to keepers specifically uh, who have to take these ideas to their managers who might be surrounded by fog Uh, what what are some suggestions about how to start to inject these ideas into organizations? Well, I think probably the greatest motivator for keepers who do need to go to management is to look at this as an opportunity to increase visitor interaction with the animals and increase guest experience. So if visitors are taking away more from watching that animal, whether in habitat or out of habitat, Um, then I think that there's a way to find shared value with management in that regard. But as far as changing spaces, uh, I have found that to be um, not the easiest to get around. And so a lot of times it's more being creative with what you have. And so you can show maybe the smallest um, advancement to management and sort of start to build that rapport and get that support that you need to continue building on on the foundation. So, um, yeah, you're sort of training snakes and sort of uh, dealing with the politics at the same time. Mm, and you can head to the Intelligence Facebook page and say, sure, uh, head over to Animal Training Academy and engage in other of those spaces too and get support and ideas there. One idea you shared, Carrie, was providing the snakes, uh, and I don't know if you talked about it within step two or step three, but providing the snakes with puzzle feeding opportunities. Can you give some examples of these? Yeah, so um, this is actually one of the first things I started doing with one of the reptilogen snakes. Uh, she was four months old when I got her. She's a, she is a uh, Australian Wilma python. And her very first, from, from day one when I started feeding her, she was fed through different puzzle feeders. And so they started out as just sort of um, laundry detergent caps with some holes uh, drilled on the bottom so that she could flip it and get to the food. So it started out quite simple. Um, then we moved to boxes where she could go into the box and find the food. We worked with mazes, quite simple mazes, maybe two or three or four turns. Um, and then uh, I also use a lot of dog enrichment devices, but you have to be a bit careful and look for ways 
that the animal may um, interact with it different than a mammal would. So, um, and I, I tend to post my uh, mistakes as well as my successes when it comes to reptilogens. But there's sometimes where uh, reptiles or ectotherms were sort of key in on where the scent is coming from and try to go through the smallest of holes to get to it rather than maybe lifting a flap or turning something as they as it's designed. Uh, but um, with her, she was able to actually get to the point of doing a device where she both had to slide a, a device one way and then slide a device another way to get to her food. I've also done some where I give her different boxes that look exactly the same with a, a lid that she has to turn. Uh, and I, I don't mean to, to screw it off like maybe some of the um, octopus enrichment that we've seen, but uh, it's simply sitting on the top and it's pinned with one nail. So she just has to slide it around, but it just keeps her from being able to accidentally knock the lid off. Um, but with these different puzzles, what I've found is that she can actually spend up to over two hours working on a specific puzzle. Um, and to me, uh, I'm starting to see some patterns. I don't have enough data to really make a claim yet, but I know that um, seeking patterns and, and foraging patterns and time budgets are quite heavily studied in mammals and birds. And I would make the hypothesis that these same type of, uh, well, not the same time type, but that foraging patterns also exist with reptiles. And so when they're able to go through their entire sequence of hunting, so sort of sensing, finding where it is, uh, figuring out how they're going to get to it, and then actually striking and grabbing that food, that if that process takes more of a natural amount of time as it would in their native habitat, I find that it actually uh, reduces um, some of the, ne the, the negative behaviors that we don't like to see in captive animals, like pacing the glass or um, maybe jumping out at us when the glass opens uh, because of anticipating food. Um, and I find they're quite calm. So with this particular snake, I can actually sit with her on the ground and she can work on her puzzle and then she'll sort of take a break and lay down or she'll crawl up over my lap and then go and, and take another break and then she'll go and interact with the puzzle again. So there seems to be um, some sort of pattern in that she gives herself so long of really hard interaction and then she sort of takes a rest and thinks about it again and then goes at it again. And I can't say, you know, what she's thinking. I, I, I wish I could, but um, I don't have that data. But um, there does seem to be this ability to stay with a particular thing for quite a long time. And I wonder how engaging that in these different reptiles might change the behavior that we see in captive reptiles in general. And building on that, what's, what's the importance of this? Can you share with you, the listeners of this podcast why you think this is important? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> it, there's a lot of reasons I think it's important. Um, one of them being that I think that reptiles don't always get the best rap in general, and they're harder to connect with for a lot of people. And so by being able to connect with them more and see them doing more, I think that we can build some, maybe some bridges to where we can be more empathetic towards them in general. So um, especially when using different dog toys, when I'm posting that to maybe not just reptile people, but to, or people that really love reptiles, but to people in general, and they see a snake able to solve this puzzle that maybe they've given their dog, they look at the reptiles quite differently than they did initially. So they say, well, I still, I still feel a bit iffy about snakes, but that's really interesting and that's really um, exciting that they're able to do that, and I can appreciate that. Um, and I think that that's just important in general for how – uh, culturally, we feel about reptiles, at least here in the States. Um, but also, it provides opportunities for these animals to practice um, their full behavior repertoire. And when you're keeping an animal in a small box with just a water bowl and paper, um, I don't know that we're allowing for that full behavior sequence. And yes, they may survive, but I don't know that they're thriving or they're showing us what they're fully capable of. And that, I think, also affects our perceptions of them so if there's when they're not offered any opportunities and they don't do anything then we look at them maybe as not as intelligent of an animal but if they are given these opportunities um i think as keepers we could develop a closer bond with them as well and understand them more as an individual and that affects their overall care and well-being and we're able to give them more choice and control because we can actually communicate in a way um 
but then I think too, um, just looking at reptiles in the overall picture, we don't know enough about them and biodiversity is so important and we're learning so much about these species and we're losing so many species every day. But, um, we, we still have so much to learn about ourselves and about other species from, from looking at reptiles. And I think it draws, it sort of pulls the lens in on them and makes them uh, look less disposable and less um, unimportant to overall. I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> yeah, no, you definitely have. And, and we're going to talk about this in the next question anyway. So I kind of just skip forward and we're going to go backwards again soon. Um, okay. And we, we talked about a lot there about the, the importance cognitively of, of in providing this enrichment for these animals. And I'm sure everyone that's listening to this podcast agrees with all the things that you've just said. You've also talked about in your presentation just the importance of giving these animals that physical exercise and giving them the ability to exercise. <laughs> Absolutely. And I don't think, honestly, that we know the extent to which, you know, keeping these animals more sedentary is really affecting them physically or affecting their offspring physically. Um, And I don't know that we will see those um, physical changes until further down the road. And hopefully, you know, before uh, it makes some sort of, you know, permanent a difference on this, these species because some of these species are only kept in human care at this point uh, because of the status of, of wild environments. And I don't know that there's been, you know, um, studies of how this affects the heart or the lungs or the muscular structure. Um, and a lot of times we do have, especially as zookeepers, this challenge of keeping these animals in smaller spaces than they would be in their native habitat. I mean, looking at uh, just a few snake species um, that I was able to find some data on, they're traveling at least maybe a mile or two from their den, but at the most, maybe 25 miles from their den uh, throughout uh, a week or a month. And so taking an animal that travels that much and saying, oh, you're fine in a box, well, they might be, but we don't know what effect that's having. And I know that there are some studies coming out, hopefully in the next couple of years, I've heard uh, bits and pieces of studying um, cortisol levels in reptiles, uh, focusing on, um, I think, snakes and uh, another species as well, another taxa. And I think that information will be quite helpful as well to see um, how it's impacting their stress levels and how that might be internalized to their physical body. Yes, exciting. So I'm quite excited. Me too. Looking forward to that. Um, just, just thank you for all that, Carrie. Just to go back a little bit, one, one of the behaviours that you discussed in your presentation that you gave at CCC in Sweden was crate training. Yes. Can you describe for people the process of crate training a snake and, and how you utilize it? Yeah, so we sort of ended up back chaining a little bit. So um, we had um, started training these snakes to come out of their habitat uh, largely on their own. Um, some of them, it's still a work in progress, uh, but we had gotten to the point where they're, you know, choosing to stay on this branch or choosing to stay on the tree, the snake tree. And the snake tree actually became quite reinforcing um, to where some snakes did not want to get off of the snake tree. Well, we didn't want to make that aversive to where we're telling them when they have to leave. And so they already had the choice to go up high to where they could not interact with guests if they wanted to. Um, and we frequently put different reinforcers on the platform. So um, different scents or heat options, uh, that type of thing. And we just found that some of them just did not want to leave because they were, they would just continue to go up and down and around and, and move around. And they're um, not expressing any stress signals to where we're worried that they are not happy. Um, and so what we sort of devised is where we'll have to um, train them to come down when they would like to and then sort of shape it to where – Uh, the crate is becoming more and more reinforcing. So what we did is actually at this point, we're still using non-food reinforcers because um, using food in that setting at this point, I don't feel would be the most appropriate uh, because we are surrounded by guests and we sort of have to find a way to make that a more controlled um, stimulus. But so we would, we simply uh, experimented with providing different things in the crate that different snakes find reinforcing. So 
perhaps Jello, the corn snake, would want to only go into a crate with some leaves in it. Uh, um, so she can sort of move around in the loose leaves or uh, a, one of the pythons may only want to go in where there's a soft fuzzy blanket or something very comforting that they can get under and feel very um, contained and, and uh, sort of comfort in there or maybe they want a heat source in there and so it sort of was a trial and error to see which snakes wanted what um, and we sort of alternate between natural substrates and uh I guess you'd say non-natural substrates and using those to sort of encourage them. And uh, what we found is that they would start to utilize, uh, they would start to tell us when they were ready to be done. So they actually start to go down the tree rather than up. And then we were able to provide the crate and they would simply go in and then we were able to uncrate them the same way by simply opening the crate and allowing them access to their habitat. And so it became a very nice solution to, um, sort of getting them off of the snake tree uh, versus um, having to make that choice for them. They were then given that choice and control. And uh, sometimes maybe they're having an off day and they don't want to be on there at all, and they can communicate that as well. We can provide the crate, and then they can um, feel safe and secure. And so, uh, yeah, it just became quite a nice solution I like overall. it, I think. We could do a whole podcast just on crate training, <laughs> but we will move on. <laughs> one, one thing you said in your... Uh, presentation and I thought it had value to just add in the end here is that learning's happening anyway um, we can't get past that we're interacting with the snakes they're interacting with us we're interacting with their environment they're interacting with their environment learning's happening so basically what you're suggesting is that we we have these discussions we think about this more we'll be creative and we just leverage what's already happening anyway yeah I mean really I mean if we're, we're looking at that snakes through kind of the same or any reptile, lizards, uh, tortoises, invertebrates, all of it. If we're looking at it through the same lens as we're looking at mammals and birds um, and all living things, and we're using sort of that those that Skinner box and those those quadrants, then we know that learning is taking place. And I think if we're honest, a lot of keepers and even hobbyists and pet owners and breeders, we can all sort of see that what we do does have an effect on what these animals are doing. We can, we can see that in their behavior. Um, but I think a lot of times we sort of put these labels instead of, oh, this snake is aggressive or that snake is grumpy or that turtle is, is stubborn or shy or whatever the case may be. But regardless, we are interacting with them. And so they are learning about us. They're learning about their environment. They're learning what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And when we're looking to try to change something, too, I think it's important to realize that we're asking that animal, as with any other animal, to change something that's working for them. So one example that I would often give my dog training students is if you want to sort of think about how hard it is for your dog to stop doing this particular thing, um, maybe just move your kitchen trash can across the room for a week or a month and, and see how many times you go to where you would normally put the trash because <laughs> that'll give you an idea, you know, how how easy it is to sort of form these habits and these behaviors that work for us and how when we're trying to change that behavior, we have to really stop and think about what we're doing and the animal does as well. And sort of giving that, that freedom, I guess I would say to, to have that safe space to learn, um, I think is, is paramount. I like it. Sadly, no, that does nearly bring us to the end, but we're heading into one of my favorite parts of the podcast show. Uh, and also before we do, thank you very much for all of that, Carrie. That was amazing. We're, we're heading into story time now, though. Carrie, can you please share with everyone listening two or three stories from your experience training reptiles, training snakes, training any animal so far, and some of the important lessons that you've learned along the way? Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose I can start with one um, lizard story. Um, probably pretty close to the beginning of when I first started training reptiles, I was working with a young um, Euromastix, which is a spiny tailed lizard. It's a kind of a smaller, very similar to um, to Nick Gomez family. It's very similar to maybe a beard dragon or a chakwala, but they're a bit different. And I was training her to get on the scale. And so we had frequently used the, this very savory enforcer that she loved, these sweet peas. 
And I decided that I was going to go and get a whole bunch of other wonderful new reinforcers. <laughs> so I had berries and bee pollen and all of these, these things. And so um, we're having quite a good session. <laughs> and I'm thinking, ah, I will give her a, a better reward uh, than she is used to. I'll give her, you know, this piece of what uh, I think it was a berry. And so she got it. <laughs> she she looked at it and she realized that it was not a sweet pea. And she tail whipped and turned around and ran down under her hide and sat there for quite a few seconds, came back up, jumped on the edge of the habitat, looked at me, went back under her hide and sort of just stayed there and wiggled her tail every so often, just shaking it. And so I was like, well, what have I just seen? <laughs> because, uh, you know, even at this point, I'm still not, I've, I, I'm operating under the assumption that obviously animals can be trained, but uh, I was not expecting, you know, um, probably that degree of emotion. So I immediately got on, you know, uh, and emailed a bunch of colleagues. And I think I, I even emailed uh, Dr. Susan Friedman and I said, what have I just seen? And of course they all say, well, you need more data. And it, that's exactly true. But it, I did learn quite a bit from that in that um, these if then contingencies are so important. And when you sort of change it, even if you think you're doing it for the better, sometimes it's not for the better for that animal. And so you have to really sort of pick um what you're doing based on that data that you have and, and don't sort of try to change it in the middle because um, it can kind of throw you, throw you off. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, let me see. Uh, and then uh, I do have a story from when I was, was dog trainer. Um, I was asked to uh, help with, this situation where these animals had been abandoned on a, a property and the, the owner was experiencing quite a bit of trouble. And so um, a, a colleague invited me out to help saying, ah, well, can you come just assess these animals and, and help us out? Well, it turned out to be quite more involved. But at, at a certain point, we'd caught all but, but one or two dogs and this puppy. And this one dog that we hadn't caught was quite aggressive. And so I was working with uh, quite a new friend of mine, and she was uh, a, a strict vegetarian. And I was bringing out these piles of raw meat, and we were using a system of positive reinforcement um, as well as uh, using moving away as a reinforcer. So I was asking her to approach this dog throw this food, this raw meat, which she was quite disgusted by, <laughs> and then walk away. And so I, I think I'm, I'm always quite impressed with the level of trust that people put in us as trainers and really sort of humbled by that and um, uh, motivated by that to do the very best that I can and, and take on that responsibility with, with a proper um, somberness and not uh, disrespect that. And so, I mean, she was willing to to do these things and, and it, it worked. And then to see the benefits of that and to be able to get that, that dog on a leash and out to rescue and into a new home, it was quite rewarding, but to do so, I mean, I was really quite reliant on that trust. And um, so it's not just animals we build trust with. It's, it's also people. And I think we just need to remember to respect that trust, whether it's with, with an animal or with a person. I like it. So the, the importance of if then contingencies and we've talked about building trust with our ectoferms and snakes and reptiles, today. Uh, but we've also got to remember to do that with each other. Yes, absolutely. You, of course, did not disappoint with those wonderful stories. Sadly, it <laughs> does bring us to our final question for this episode. Carrie, could you please take us all into the future and share with us what you would really like to see happen over the next five to ten years in the animal training, snake training, the firm training world? Oh, yes. Uh, I wish it could happen in the next year. But, um, yeah, I hope that we continue to learn more about these magnificent animals, that we incorporate this into our husbandry. I think we, we may see uh, reptile husbandry as it exists uh, change to be quite different. So I hope that we will. Um, I hope that we will um, – start to be able to encourage natural behavior more in a captive environment, um, not just for educational purposes with others, but also in the relationships that we have with these animals and also just for their overall well-being that um, we engage them in ways that uh, really give them this 
full life as they would have in their native habitat. I hope that we, through that, can inspire a love uh, and an empathy for, for ectotherms that um, maybe we all don't have at this point, but I know that we don't all have at this point. Um, and, and through that, we can preserve some of these nat- native spaces where these animals live. Um, and I hope that, that just in general, the perception about, um, about reptiles changes in that we can start to see that if they are capable of preferences, if they're capable of making choices, that they're capable of behavior, that they're capable of operant conditioning. And if they're capable of behavior, that there there has to be an element of emotion tied to those behaviors. And, it, and it's really up to us as caretakers to recognize that and address those emotions as well as part of the whole animal. So uh, I think I would like to see um, the spaces and the husbandry uh, change, which is something that we talk about quite a bit um, in the group attached to reptilogence, is how how can we make our spaces um, inviting and safe for the animals so that it, it encourages training and that it encourages behavior um, and makes it a safe space where we can communicate back and forth. Um, I would like to see our knowledge grow. Uh, so that we understand ah, that I, you know, had a, a colleague that was a uh, neuroscientist or someone that has some interest in actually studying these the reptile brain and how they are they are processing this because I think that's one of the big hiccups when we come to sort of butt heads between traditional management is well reptiles don't have this part of the brain that would allow them to do this and so um, I think if we can study that and see how they are making these decisions what's what's most motivating that, um, what's driving their behavior, how are they processing. I mean, we only, I think, barely have uh, the tip of that even when it comes to mammals and birds. But if we can start to see the, that the brain is capable of this, I think that would move us, us forward quite a bit faster. Um, and then just I would love to see the, the citizen science of just everyone who has an interest in this, just jump in and do it and please take data and, and share your data because if we aren't sharing with each other, um, it's going to take us even longer to get ahead and don't just share successes, <laughs> share failures as well. I think that's so important and something that so often we're leery to do because it's not really a safe space to do that. But when we share our failures, we can move together so much faster. We can move forward together. And so um, I would just like to see uh, all of that and, and, in the next year, if possible, that would be great. <laughs> no, in the next in the next ten years, I suppose. And Reptelligence is a safe place to go discuss this stuff. Animal Training Academy is for people that want to take you up on this challenge. Where can they go out? Or where can they go? I should say, sorry. Where can they go to find out more about Reptelligence and and what you're doing? Can you? Provide us the links, probably, or yeah. Uh, so, if you go to Facebook slash Reptelligence, you can find um, the page there. You can certainly uh, click and follow that. Uh, in addition to that page, there is attached to that page a group where we discuss. Uh, training in particular, people post different training and enrichment that they're doing. You're um, quite able to get feedback. It's very closely monitored, so it's ve- it's a very safe space to do that. Um, and everyone is sort of of the of a similar mind in that we are all wanting to see each other succeed. Um, so it's very a very safe place to do that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in the future, hopefully, uh, we will expand uh, web presence a bit more. But for now, that's probably the best way. Fantastic. And we will link to all of this in the podcast right up as well. So if you're unsure, head over to animaltrainingacademy.com and check out the podcast section, find Carrie's episode, and it'll all be included in there for you, nice and simple. Hey, thank you so much for sharing everything today, Carrie. And so before we do officially wrap up, from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show today. It's mega appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was an honor and it was great to, you know, be able to discuss some of these topics. I think it's every time that I get to discuss it with someone else who shares a similar interest, it just builds so much more uh, motivation and and excitement in me to continue to move forward. And um, I think probably maybe the best, uh, the best information and research and training is yet to come and probably 
from others who are smarter and <laughs> and more uh, intelligent than I am, but I'm excited to be part of this process and, and to see it happening. And uh, yeah, I'm just thrilled. Well, uh, so thank you for the opportunity. Well, I hope that we lived up to, and I don't know we don't like to use labels, but I hope that we lived up to the behavior nerd label that we said at the start of the episode. <laughs> I think so. I think so. We do, of course, appreciate you tuning in today and hanging out with us. If you have enjoyed the episode and you are interested in carrying on these conversations about most positive, less intrusive ways of influencing behavior, then as mentioned at the start of the episode, the ATA, the Animal Training Academy community, is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn all about how you can connect with like-minded, positive reinforcement-based animal trainers from around the globe. Whether you train or are thinking about training dogs, cats, birds, pets, zoo animals, vet clinics, zoos, kennels, wherever behavior management is required, you will love all the different ways you can join in forums, WhatsApp chats, private Facebook group, live web classes. There's something there for absolutely everyone. And we are looking forward to having you join the family. That's it for this episode, though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much for listening, everyone. But for now, you'll hear from us again soon. Toodaloo.